Productions. يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشى في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسى يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشى القائد أعلى المسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى إذ قالت الملائكة يا مريم إن الله يبشرك بكلمة منه اسمه المسيح عيسى بن مريم اسمه المسيح ويكلم الناس في المهد وكلا ومن الصالحين قالت رب أنا يكون لي ولد ولم يمسسني بشر قال كذلك الله يخلق ما يشاء إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Almighty God for this opportunity to discharge our responsibility, to convey a message, and to attempt to inform and to educate those whose hearts and minds are open. And we realize that whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, wants guidance for them, he opens their chest. And whomsoever's heart is restricted from preconditioning or prejudice or ignorance, then such a heart is similar to that of a rock and water only passes over it. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the, the opportunity to speak on this auspicious occasion and upon this very critical topic. Those of you who are non-Muslims, of course, you recognize immediately that we have titled the lecture Jesus the Prophet of Allah. And to clarify this issue, this is not another God. This is not the God of the Arabs or God of the Muslims. And therefore, we are not trying to usurp Jesus Christ for ourselves. But the word Allah 
is a more proper name for the Creator, a name which He has chosen for Himself, a name which He has chosen for Himself in all the scriptures. We found that Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon and Isaac and Ismail and John the Baptist and Jesus Christ himself and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they all used the nomenclature Allah because this title Allah meaning the only absolute creator author of creation Lord and sustainer of the heavens and the earth the creator of man and the environment which man lives in the word Allah is an exclusive title it cannot be used for anything whether tangible nor a thought and because of that we want to use the word Allah as opposed to God because the word God has been used in the English language interchangeable when we use the word God we will use the word Almighty God because at least that modifies the word and qualifies the word God so that we know that we are referring to Almighty Allah now in our discussion about Jesus Christ the son of Mary we want to first do our best to remove the distortions after all we want to talk about after all we want to talk about Jesus Christ the son of Mary that man from Nazareth that rabbi, that teacher who walked the streets and ate food and drank and rested and cried and sweat and slept and like all other human beings at times became frustrated. We want to talk about Jesus Christ, the son of Mary the one who received from Almighty God a scripture that was called the Evangel. The Evangel, or in English we can translate the Evangel meaning the good news. Or in Arabic, the Injil. Just, just so that there is no confusion in our minds about whom we're speaking about, we want to make a distinction between Almighty God who sent Jesus Christ, who created Jesus Christ, who created the world, to make a distinction between Almighty God and Jesus Christ. For us Muslims, we don't need to make that distinction. It's clear for us. But there may be someone here, in their minds, they may think that Jesus Christ and God, Almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, are one and the same person. So I want to give a description, a basic description, that correlates with the description of Almighty God as it comes in all the scriptures from the earliest of time all the way to the Quran. And then we're going to give a description and a discussion about Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, the servant of Almighty God. In the Quran, there is a very simple verse in the Quran. A scripture sent to the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. A scripture that was sent 1424 years ago. A scripture that is intact completely, all 6,626 verses. 
a scripture that was memorized in its entirety during the life of the prophet whom it was sent to. That prophet who was prophesied by Jesus Christ and that prophet who confirmed Jesus Christ. So in that scripture, the only scripture that is in the earth today that is preserved in its entirety, in its pure form, I want to read from that scripture a description of the Almighty. Allah, there is no deity, no God, except Him. The ever living, the self subsisting sustainer, the one upon whom all depends while he depends upon none. Neither drowsiness overtakes him nor sleep. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and on the earth. Who is it that can intercede with him except by his permission? He knows what is present in front of his servants and he knows what will be after them in the infinite past. And they cannot acquire not a single bit of knowledge except for what he has allowed them to acquire. His throne extends above and beyond the heavens and the earth and the waters and the preservation of his throne and the heavens and the earth causes him no weakness or weariness. And he is the most high and he is the most great. Now I think it should be clear that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, the prophet, the messenger, the servant of God, that he does not fit that description. We want to talk this evening about Jesus, the son of Mary, and his phenomenal birth, a birth that very few human beings, whether Muslims or Christians, have any argument about. We believe, and our Quran makes it clear for us and confirms for us that Jesus Christ, in fact, he was born without the intervention of sperm. That his mother, Mary, that blessed woman, she became pregnant by the word of God. No man touched her. Yes, she married later, and she had another son whose name was James, but this was after Jesus. We're not talking about James and the father of James. We're talking about Jesus Christ who had no father, but whose mother was Mary, the daughter of Hannah, who prayed for her. Hannah, the cousin of Zachariah, who prayed to Almighty God and asked, Oh God, indeed, I wish to consecrate what is in my womb for your service. Oh God, if you will give me a son, I will give my son over to
the keepers of the temple, the priests in the temple, like Zachariah, the prophet of Allah. And when she became pregnant and she conceived of her child, it was a girl. And she said, oh God, you have answered my prayer, but I have given birth to a girl. And the angel said to her, the angel Gabriel, that same angel that God sends to human beings, so be it. God has given you a daughter who will be one of the chiefs of the women in the hereafter. And she will be given a son who will be blessed in this world and the next. So Hannah, she was given two blessings. She was given the blessing of a daughter that would give birth to the Messiah. And she was made the grandmother of that Messiah that she prayed for. In a like manner, Mary was born. And when Mary was just a girl, Mary was placed under the custody of Zachariah, that prophet, who was in fact her uncle, who was one of the priests of the temple. And Zachariah assigned a room for Mary, a room similar to one of these rooms that might be off of this corridor if this was the main prayer hall. And only Zachariah had the key. And when he used to go and visit Mary to bring her food or to check on her, he used to find that she had food. If, in, if it was the winter time, he found she had food from the summer. And in the summer he found that she had food from the winter. And he said, oh Mary, from where do you get this sustenance? She said, it comes from God. So Zachariah, he knew this was a special girl. And on one occasion when Mary was inside her chamber where she stayed, An angel came to her in the form of a man. And because she was a chaste woman, that is a woman untouched, a virgin, not mixing with men or having paramours, when she saw this angel, this very handsome angel looking as a man, she thought him to be a man and she said to that angel, fear Allah. Do not come near me. As any chaste woman would do if she found a man in her chamber. And that angel announced to her, O oh Mary, I am a messenger from God sent to you to announce to you that you will be the recipient of a word from God whose name will be Esau. Jesus. Isa al-Masih, a kalam from Allah, a word from Allah, and a ruh given to you. Listen to this word well. Who was Jesus Christ? A word from God. Not God, but a word from God. A special spirit given to Mary under the command of God whose name will be what? Esau al-Masih. Jesus the anointed. Or Jesus the appointed. Or Jesus the Christ. And Mary said to that angel, how will I have a son when no man has ever touched me and I am not the kind of woman that walk in the streets? That angel said to her, what he said to her mother, so be it. When Almighty God wills a thing, he says unto it, as he said to Adam, 
as he said to Eve, as he said to the world, he says unto it, be, and they become. And at that moment, when the angel said that, Mary found in her stomach something moving, as women find in their stomachs when they discover that they're pregnant, they have conceived. The difference in this case that Mary conceived without that angel touching her, she conceived by the order of the Almighty. And we believe that because we believe that the Almighty has the power to create and to do whatsoever he wills in any way, shape, time, condition that he wills. And our belief concerning Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ is the likeness of Adam, the first man, the first prophet, our father, Adam. He had no mother and he had no father. And Eve, his mate, his wife, she had no father and she had no mother. So what is more difficult for Almighty God? To create Jesus Christ with a mother and no father, or Adam and Eve, both of them, no mother and father. Which one? Obviously, both are easy for God. When Mary conceived of Jesus Christ after some time, God ordered her to go to a place in the east. We don't know exactly where that place is, although in the scriptures it calls it Bethlehem. Beit Lahem. Beit Lahem, it means a place where the people used to go for meat. Where there maybe there was a lot of uh, butcher shops there. Beit Lahem or Bethlehem. She went to a place in the east. And she was grieving, like women start grieving in that eight and a half, eight and three quarter time period from the pains prior to her delivery. And she sat down by a tree, hungry, thirsty, but following the orders of God to be where she was. And the angel appeared to her again and said, Oh Mary, put your hands on this tree and shake it. You will find fruit will fall down on you. This tree was a date tree. And if any one of you go out in the street here and look at these palm trees, you get an idea what a date tree looks like. But a date tree is a special palm tree. Most of them, when they give dates, they are this big around. A very powerful tree. No fragile woman has the ability to put her hands on that kind of tree and shake it. But Mary was a servant of God. She did what the angel ordered her. She put her hands on it and she pushed. And that tree shook. And the dates fell down in her lap and she ate from those dates given to her from God. And a stream came from under that tree and she drank from that tree. For God wanted to nourish her and God wanted to nourish her son in her womb, the Messiah. And when Mary had the baby, she said, oh God, what will I tell the people? Because already people were saying to her, they were spreading stories about her, that she's an harlot, that she's a prostitute, that she has fornicated. They were spreading those stories because she was already pregnant. Everyone knew that. She didn't know how to answer. The angel told her, Mary, when you have the child, don't say any word, but point to the child. The child will speak to them himself the first miracle of 
Jesus Christ. He spoke to the people from the cradle. This phenomenal birth of Jesus Christ, fully accepted by us Muslims, fully documented by the Quran itself, should be of no surprise to the Christians or to anyone else, for God is able to do whatever he wants to do. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. A word from Almighty God. And what does the word Messiah mean? And Messiah, it means one who is touched by God. One who is anointed by God. And one who is appointed by God. Al Messiah. This is qualified and confirmed both in the scriptures as well as in the Quran. Jesus Christ was a messenger and a prophet of Almighty God. What is a messenger? A messenger is someone who is appointed or ordered by Almighty God and selected by him to deliver a message. The name of his message was the Evangel, the Gospel. The good news, not a comprehensive system, but an indication, an announcement of good news. He was a prophet and a messenger to the children of Israel. Not a prophet and a messenger to the whole world. He never said in his words, I came to the whole world. No, he said to his disciples, go not unto the Samaritans or to the Sabbateans. For I have not been sent to the Gentiles, the Romans, the Sabbateans or the Nabateans or the Samaritans. I have been sent to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. He made it clear that's who he came for. Why did he come to them? He came to them because they had drifted and deviated and corrupted the teachings that had come before Jesus Christ to the extent that they plotted and killed Jesus Christ's cousin. You know his cousin, the son of Zechariah. His name was John. We know him as Yahya. But his name was John. John and Jesus were the same age. Not the same age that means born the same day, but John and Jesus both, by the command of God, were lifted out of this world, taken out of this world. John slaughtered, beheaded. Jesus Christ lifted at the age of 33. John and Jesus were cousins. You know the story of John, don't you? John was the son of Zachariah, who was who? The custodian of Mary, the cousin of Mary's mother, Hannah, the priest of the temple. And that priest, on one occasion, he did what Hannah did. He supplicated to God because he wanted a son. But he was an old man. Zachariah was 110 years old. Can you imagine a man 110 years old praying to God for a son? Rationally, he's a little bit late in his supplication. Now, Zachariah was 110, and his wife was 90. What do you think she thought? But Zachariah was a prophet. And the supplications of prophets are answered. Because they are the people most loved by God. Because they were appointed by God. Because they are servants of God. And whomever serves God and loves God is almost like his son. 
Although God doesn't really have sons in that sense, but they are selected and God loves them like that. So when they supplicate, God gives to them as you and I would give to our sons and daughters. So Zachariah asked God for a son. And that same angel came to Zachariah and said, Oh, Zachariah, Allah has answered your prayer. You will have a son. And Zachariah, he thought and he said, How will I have a son when I can no longer emit sperm? This is what the word means. I'm a man whose source of water and strength in his back has dried up. This means he has not the ability to emit sperm. And he said, and my wife, she has not the ability to, cre to, to produce a fertilized egg. This is what it means. She's a woman who is barren. Of course, she should be by 90. The angel said to him, what that angel said to Hannah and what that angel said to Mary, the angel said to Zachariah, so be it. When Almighty God decrees a thing, that is simple for God. He says, be, and it is. And when Zachariah went to his wife and told her that she would be pregnant with a son, she laughed. As you laughed. But just as she laughed, she felt the child in her stomach. And this is the miracle of the birth of John. Like the miracle of Jesus Christ, Jesus was born of a mother who had no husband and had not been impregnated with sperm. John the Baptist, as he was called, he was born of a father, 110, and a woman and a mother that was barren. They were cousins. Both of their lives, signs of Almighty God. John was the precursor to Jesus Christ. He was preaching. He was teaching. He was leading. He was doing what his father ordered him to do. After his father died, John was preaching, leading, guiding the people. But who conspired against him? The elders from the Bani Israel. Until they plotted on him and had him beheaded and killed. But before that happened, John received Jesus Christ and he was the one that baptized Jesus Christ, his cousin. Now most of you should have learned these stories in Sunday school or Monday school. You should have learned these stories either at home or in church or reading the Bible yourselves because it's there. It's there in very plain language. These are certain stories that they couldn't play with. It's there. You may read it as a myth if you don't believe in God, but if you believe in God, if he created this world with all of his diversity, you read it as scripture. We Muslims have it confirmed for us in the Quran. Jesus was called that man from Nazareth. Why? Because he began walking, talking, healing the people, preaching from Nazareth all the way to Jerusalem and all the cities in between. So they called him. The Romans used to call him. Who is that man preaching and talking, healing the lepers? Who is he? They call him Jesus. Some call him the rabbi. Some call him the teacher. He's that man from Nazareth. That man that was born in Bethlehem. Those people that walked with Jesus Christ. Those people that sat with Jesus Christ, listened to him, received his hands as he laid it on them, witnessed his miracles from one town to another from day to day. Those people were called Nazarenes. They weren't called Christians. 
They were called Nazarenes. And those that stayed with him, whom he trusted, who served him, they were called his helpers. The Ansar, Nasara. Those were his disciples, the ones whom he trusted the most, those who he called by name, those who served him, those that imitated him, those that learned directly from him. We now know that there was at least 12 or 13 of them in number. Jesus was that great rabbi who performed miracles by the power given to him by the Almighty. Jesus, yes, he did heal the lepers. He did cause their wounds to heal instantly. He did cause the blind to see. He removed the cataract from their eyes without surgery. He touched their eyes and they were able to see. He touched their bodies and they were healed. He touched their ears and they were able to hear. He called Lazarus out of the grave because he was challenged. If you are that great prophet, if you are who you say you are, bring the dead back to life. He said, that's what you want to see? So he supplicated to God and then he went to the grave and he said, Lazarus, in the name of God, in the name of Allah, come out of there. Rise up out of the grave. And right in front of the people, what do you think happened? He came up out of the grave and walked. After he was dead and everybody witnessed he was dead. So he healed the people. He caused them to see. He caused them to hear. He raised the dead. He took a clay bird, a pigeon made of clay, and he blew into it and it flew in front of the people. He fed 10,000 people from seven loaves of bread and seven fish. How do you do that? Now that's, that's, that's economizing. Did he say he did it by his power? No, he said when they asked him, I can of my own self do nothing. Would that be Almighty God in the form of a man doing his own miracles and then when he's asked, say, I can of my own self do nothing and I am not greater than the one who sent me. This is Jesus Christ, that great rabbi and teacher who performed those miracles by the power of whom? By the power of Almighty God. Jesus was that one that was accused, plotted against, and convicted by the high priest. What did they accuse him of? They plotted on him because they knew there was two things they could say. He called himself the son of God. And according to their, their uh, uh, beliefs, according to their scripture, anyone that called themselves the son of God was what? A pagan. No Jewish person today would call themselves the son of God. And Jesus Christ was from what tribe? The tribe of Judah. But Jesus Christ, if he used that terminology, he used it in the scriptural sense. Just like God said that Isaiah is my son. And God said that David is my son. And God said that Abraham is my son. But God didn't mean that, that was, those were his sons from a wife that he laid down with. God didn't mean that those were his sons that he begat. God didn't mean those were some special exclusive sons, but it meant in the Aramaic language 
a person chosen by God, a person that is loved by God, a person that is selected by God, a person that is protected by God. And so God loves that person. And Jesus Christ was one of those persons. And he spoke that way. For instance, I was born a Christian. And as a matter of fact, I compete with all Christians in my love and attachment to Jesus Christ and his message. I believe I know more about Jesus Christ and his life and his mother and his grandfather and his legacy than most Christians. As a matter of fact, most Christians really should call themselves Christologists. Because it's the study. It is what people say about Jesus Christ. Not who Jesus Christ was or how he actually lived. For he himself never told anyone to call themselves Christians. But I was born a Christian, we can say that. That nomenclature was put upon me. And as a Christian, I asked about this issue of Jesus Christ being the, the son of God. I wanted to understand that. I wanted to understand how could Jesus be God's son and also be God and also be a divine person among three persons that's part of the one God. Now see if you can mathematically fig uh, figure that out. The Trinity says God in three persons, whether you're following the, the Nicene Creed or the Athanasian Creed or the Apostles Creed, they all say God in three persons, person, person, person. Now how do you get one, two, three, one? How do you get one God out of person, person, person? And they make it clear that each one is a person and a divine personality, yet they all are one God. A mystery that has never been solved in 2,000 years. No Christian, no minister, no cardinal, no priest, not even the Pope or any of the church fathers can tell you today how that is. So they've all decided to use a word to sum it all up. It's a mystery, my son. Well, that's a mystery I think that a hundred Sherlock Holmes will never be able to figure out. I think you need a little bit more than forensic science to figure that mystery out. But Jesus Christ himself, he answered what he meant by son. Because you and I both know that when Jesus Christ was asked, oh rabbi, teach us how to pray. Jesus Christ gave the Christians or his disciples, the Nazarenes, he gave them a prayer that all of you know to be the Lord's prayer. How many people are Christians here? Don't be shy, let me see. Good, there's enough. Let's walk through, let's walk through, let's talk through the Lord's prayer. I mean, it's a good prayer. He said, I will teach you how to pray. He said, our father who art in heaven. He didn't say my father. He didn't say my father. If he was the exclusive son of almighty God, then he would have said my father who art in heaven. What did he say, Christians? Our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, not my name, not our name, but thy name. He's speaking in the second person. The second person exclusive. Thy kingdom come. Whose kingdom come? My kingdom come? If Jesus is God and he's part of the Godhead, he's one of the three, then he owns part of that too. He should say, our kingdom come. 
Thy will be done. I'm not being facetious here. I'm quoting a prayer. A prayer that I also feel passionately about. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Who's eating bread? Us. That means Jesus Christ and his mother is both eating bread, isn't it? And if you, if you eat bread, you're going to drink some water or some juice or something. And if you're drinking, eating bread and drinking juice, the body only uses part of it. The rest of it, the body, casts out. Now, can you imagine Almighty God eating bread and drinking juice, defecating and urinating? Now, use your mind, Christians. We're not talking mathematics here. We're not talking high science here. We're not embarrassing anybody here. We're not casting aspersions on anybody here. We're not criticizing or condemning anybody here. We're making sense. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Who's trespassing? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into, lead us not into temptation. God being tempted. But deliver us from evil. God asking himself to be delivered. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Is that the Lord's prayer? Is that the Lord's prayer? Yes. Jesus made the Lord's prayer and he taught the disciples the Lord's prayer. So that Lord's prayer he made was for him and everyone else. That Lord's prayer that I just read sounds something like what I read from the Quran initially. It almost sounds something like the Fatiha that we recite 27 times a day. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praises to Almighty God, Lord of the worlds. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the compassionate and the merciful. Maliki Yawm din Master of the Day of Judgment. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'een, to you do we worship, thine aid do we seek. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem, guide us on the straight path. Those, the path of those who receive your ni'mah, your favors. And not those who receive your wrath or those who go astray. That's what we say in the Quran, similar to what Jesus said according to the scripture. No contradiction there at all. Jesus, the one accused of being the son of God, while he didn't mean son in the literal sense, but the Jews, the high priests, that he ran out of the temples. You know, people say that Jesus was a prophet of love, prophet of peace. But when he went inside that temple and found those people changing money inside the temple, he wasn't so peaceful, was he? What did he do? He grabbed some sticks and he started beating them across their backs and their heads and ran them out of the temple and said that you are not the sons of Abraham, you are the sons of your father, the devil. For if you were the sons of Abraham, you would be do doing the works of Abraham. That's what he told them. And because of that, they began to plot against him. And they went to Pontius Pilate who was, who was Pontius Pilate? We're talking about a lesson here in history. Who was Pontius Pilate? He wasn't a myth. He's a real, he was the head of Dodge City. He was the governor of Jerusalem. He was a governor appointed by Caesar. And they went to Pontius Pilate and they asked him, we want you to indict this man. 
He calls himself the son of God. And besides that, he calls himself the king of the Jews. King of the Jews meant it's a felony against Caesar. Son of God, it's a felony against us. Pontius Pilate said, okay, bring him here. You know the story. When he came to Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate asked him, what do you say about the crime, about the accusation that you call yourself the son of God? He said, thou sayest I'm the son of God. Then Pontius Pilate said, and what do you say about the accusation they make that you call yourself king of the Jews? He said, thou sayest I'm the king of the Jews. Does that sound like a man who said, yes, I am the son of God. Yes, I am the king of the Jews. No, it doesn't because Pontius Pilate said after that to those high priests, I find no fault with this man. And he washed his hands of that issue and he told the Jews, if you want to convict him, you convict him yourselves. And they say, if you do not find him guilty, thou art not a friend of Caesar's. So just like today, they use their powerful lobby to put pressure on that governor to do what? To hand over Jesus Christ to them. Jesus Christ, who spoke to his disciples in the upper room about that comforter. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane when he was up in that upper room, when he said to Almighty God, Oh, oh God, if it be your will, remove this cup from me. Who's he talking to? Himself? When he talked to his disciples in that upper room after they ate that last supper that came from the sky, a supper that wasn't cooked for them, a supper that was prepared for them for God, from, for, uh, by God uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, brought to them by the malaika from the sky in that upper room, they asked him, O oh, Rabbi, what will happen to us after you leave us? He said, fear not. Because after I leave you, the comforter, that counselor, will come. And they said, who is he? You will know him when he comes, because he will confirm me. He will speak of me. And you will know him when he comes, because he will not speak of himself, but whatever he hears from God, that will he speak. You will know him because your hearts and your minds are asking for many things, but they are not prepared for that. So be it when he, the comforter, comes, he will relate to you all things in detail. You will know him when he comes, because when he speaks, that which he brings will remain with you forever. This is in the scripture. He's given a prophecy of somebody who would come afterwards. So who came after that to fulfill that prophecy? Did Jesus come back? Who was the Holy Ghost? Did the Holy Ghost come back? What human example and what prophet fulfilled that revelation, that prophecy by Jesus Christ that's in his gospel? And it's in greater detail. If you look to the gospel of St. Barnabas, that was, that was excluded. If you read the gospel of Barnabas, his name is there. The name Muhammad is there. That admirable one, that praiseworthy one is there. Barnabas, that was the one that was blind. That was the disciple that was blind. You remember that. But they took that gospel out because they didn't like that one. Jesus Christ, who appeared unto his disciples afterwards, after the conspiracy to crucify him and kill him, and Almighty God says to us in this Quran, they crucified him not, they killed him not. Therefore, we are of the conviction and sound conviction that somebody was crucified, somebody was put on the cross, maybe somebody died, but it wasn't Jesus Christ. Almighty God says to us, they killed him not, they crucified him not. And let's look at the definition of crucifixion. Crucifixion is not putting somebody on the cross. That's not crucifixion. Crucifixion means death on the cross, isn't it? If I say electrocution, execution by injection or by electrocuting, 
It means a person has to die. Because if we just shoot some electricity through their body and they don't die, is that called execution? No. If we inject them and they don't die, is that execution? No. If we gas them, and after all the gas is finished, they're still laughing and looking at us. Is that execution? No. So if Jesus was put on the cross and he didn't die on the cross, it means what? He was not crucified and he was not killed. And we have evidence of that fact. Because right after the alleged conspiracy, Joseph of Arathamia, one of his disciples, who was an executive, who was a Roman citizen, very wealthy, he went to Pontius Pilate and he asked Pontius Pilate, please let me have his body. Let me have him. And on what day do they claim that they put Jesus Christ on the cross? What day do they claim? What day is that called? What day is that called before Easter? Good Friday, isn't it? Is it Good Friday? And Friday begins what day when the sun goes down according to the Jewish faith? Friday at sunset is what for the Jewish people? It's the Sabbath, isn't it? Well, any Jewish people will tell you that at sundown, no Jew can be executed. So if Jesus Christ was put on the cross, he had to be taken down before sunset. And that's consistent with whatever people talk about, about darkness came over the earth and the whole earth became black. Of course, there was only three people on that Galgotha hill, Mary Magdalena, Mary, his mother, and Joseph of Arathamia were the only three witnesses. The rest of them dispersed as he said they would. But three days later, or two days later, when they came to look in the sepulcher, looking for the body of Jesus Christ, when they came to look for him, what did they find? What did they find? Nobody was there. The body was not there. The huge stone that covered the mouth of the cave. The huge stone that covered the mouth of the, stave, the cave that had closed the mouth of the cave. Where was that stone? It had been rolled back, isn't it? And part of the garment was still there. And they looked for him every place. And Mary of Magdalena said that she met someone whom she thought was the gardener. And he called her by her name, O oh Mary, it is I. Don't you recognize me? And when Jesus came to his disciples, they thought he was a ghost and they were afraid. And he said to them, fear not, it is I. Feel me, feel me, touch me. A ghost I am not, a spirit I am not. So they thought that he had died and that he was a ghost. And he clarified to them, don't be afraid. It is I, a spirit I am not. And to confirm to them, he said, I am hungry. Give me something to eat. And what did they give him? Some fish and honeycomb. Have you ever seen a ghost eating fish and honeycomb? If he was a ghost or a spirit, he wouldn't have to move the rock back. He would walk through it. If he was a ghost, he wouldn't tell them, don't be afraid, it is I. If he was a ghost, he wouldn't ask for fish and honeycomb to eat. So that was Jesus telling them, I am not dead. As God said, they crucified him not, they killed him not. Later on, three of the disciples, they witnessed Jesus Christ being raised up through the clouds. And someone asked them, why are you gazing at the clouds? And they say, can you not see the Son of Man being lifted up? And God says, they killed him not, but we lifted him up. Consistent, the Quran and the scripture. Jesus, who was lifted up to the heavens and protected by God, 
to return as one of the major signs before the day of judgment. That is what the Quran tells us, that Jesus was lifted up by God, but that Jesus will return. He will be one of the major signs before the day of judgment. And when he comes back, he will kill the Antichrist, the Dajjal. He will kill the swine, meaning every filthy thing. And he will pray with all the prophets of Almighty God. And he will be the Imam before the day of judgment. Jesus, the son of Mary, the man, the prophet, the messenger of God, slandered and maligned by the treacherous high priest among the Bani Israel and duped, slandered and maligned by those unfortunate people who called themselves at that time Christians who were really pagan Romans. They were duped by an apostate named Paul. I didn't say an apostle, I said an apostate. He called himself an apostle. But the history of Paul is that he was Saul of Tarsus. Let's get your history together. He was Saul of Tarsus. He was an apostate Hebrew, what we call today a reformed Jew. That means he ate swine. He drank alcohol. He didn't pray as the Jews did anymore. As a matter of fact, he was a bounty hunter. who hunted and searched for Christians and brought them in to be punished and killed for a price. Saul of Tarsus, a Jew and a Roman citizen, where the word, a gentleman and a scholar, you heard that terminology, right? A Gentile man and a scholar, that's the best of two worlds. That's a reformed Jewish person who is also a citizen of Rome. Paul of Tarsus, who himself said, one day I was on the road to Damascus hunting for Christians, as he normally did, riding his horse with two or three other people. And he said that I saw a light which blinded me. I heard a voice and I fell off of my horse. And he said that Jesus Christ appeared to him in a vision. I said in a vision, not Jesus Christ jumped out of the bushes. And Jesus Christ said to him in a vision, Paul, Paul, why do you resist my mission? Or why do you kick against the goads? Or why do you resist the message of the church? However you want to interpret it. Paul, you have been appointed and chosen by me as an apostle to the Gentiles. Didn't we just read a, a, a little while ago that Jesus Christ said, go not unto the Samaritans, go not unto the Gentiles? Here's a contradiction right there. As a result of that so-called vision and that self-appointment by Paul, as a result of that, the New Testament was written. And what's the name of, the New, what's the name of Paul's books? Do you know the names of them? They begin with what? Acts, isn't it? After that, what is Acts? You got the Epistles. You got the Colossians. You got the Romans. All of these different books that were written to whom? The Romans, the Samaritans, the Gentiles. By whom? By Paul. What we have today in Christology is the writings of Paul. Seven-eighths of all the writings of Jesus Christ is written by Paul. Who was the first person that said that Jesus is the Son of God? Was it Jesus himself? Never. Jesus never said, I'm the Son of God. Who said it? Paul said it. Who was the first one that said that Jesus is God? Jesus never said it. Paul said it. Who was the first one that said that Jesus was one person in the Trinity? Paul said it. Who was the people that adopted it? The Romans. And it became official in the Council of Nicaea, three, 354 years after Jesus Christ. And as for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
None of them ever saw Jesus Christ. Never laid their eyes on Jesus Christ. Never sat with him, never ate with him, never prayed with him, never walked with him. Matthew wrote whatever he wrote, if he wrote it, 40 years after Jesus. John wrote it, if he wrote it, 80 years after Jesus. So here's four gospels before Paul who never saw, walked, talked, prayed, or even laid their eyes on Jesus Christ, and Paul, who was a bounty hunter, a killer of Christians, who said that he saw him in a vision. And here's the whole, here's the whole kit. The whole kit called the New Covenant or the New Testament. And that's why Christians today have so many mysteries and so many problems and so many inconsistencies. Now, don't be angry with me. Because I had to find my way through that maze. It wasn't through my intelligence. It wasn't because I was clever. It wasn't because I was righteous. It wasn't because I was doing so much research. But the Quran made it so crystal clear. I would have to be a pure hypocrite after reading the Quran to keep on believing those mysteries. Jesus, the son of Mary, the man, the prophet, the messenger of God, slandered and maligned by those that hated him and made into a man God, the son of God, a distinct divine person of the persons in the so-called Trinity. I want to remind you just of a few things. One, that Jesus Christ prophesied the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. He called him that comforter. He said he would explain all things in detail. He would not speak of himself. Whatever he hears, that shall he speak. He will speak of me. What is recited to him shall remain with you forever. So therefore, Jesus prophesied Muhammad, and the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, prophesied Jesus Christ. And here's the book in which Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, received from his Lord that confirmed Jesus Christ. How clear it could it be that in this book, there is a chapter among 114 chapters that is named Mariam. Who is Mariam? That is Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. Certainly, it would have been more appropriate, we would think, that a book given to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, would have a chapter dedicated to his mother, his mother's name was Amina. So there should be, we would think, a chapter in here dedicated to Muhammad's mother. But it isn't, because it wasn't necessary. But it was necessary for a book to be named after Mariam, to speak about the birth of Mariam, the birth of Mariam's son, Jesus Christ, and all the connection of Jesus Christ in his life and his miracles, because Jesus said what? He will speak of me. What else did he say? That whatever he speaks of will not be from himself, but whatever is revealed to him from God. Muhammad said that this was revealed to him from God. What else did he say? That it would explain all things in detail. The Quran says, verily this is a book from Almighty God that explains all things in detail. What else did he say? that that which he received from God would remain with you forever. The Quran was revealed 1,424 years ago, just as it is, 6,626 verses. And non-Muslim scholars will tell all of us, this is the greatest miracle of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. And yes, this book was memorized in its entirety by many of his companions. And that's why today in this room, there's at least one Muslim here that has memorized this whole book. You can't go to any country in the world, hardly any Muslim village in the world, where there's an, at least one person that hasn't memorized the whole book. You won't find a Christian in the whole world that has memorized the Bible because they don't even know what the Bible is. One example that we can give is that if all the Bibles of the world was thrown in the ocean. All the Bibles, throw them in the ocean, burn them all up. 
And then after that, see if the Christians can create a new Bible. They can't do it because they don't even know how many chapters and how many books it is. They don't agree. But if all the Qurans, all the books were burned, thrown in the ocean today, in one day, it comes right back because there are literally tens of millions of Muslims that have memorized this whole book as it was memorized in the life of the Prophet وسلم, before he passed away. So what did Jesus Christ say? A book that would remain with you forever. Jesus Christ never said that he was God or the exclusive son of God. Jesus never said that he was one divine person in a three God trinity. Jesus never asked or ordered anyone to worship him. Any Christian that's here, show me in your Bible where Jesus Christ said, I am God, worship me. We'll raise a thousand dollars for you right now. You got your Bibles with you? Give you five minutes to look for it. We can raise a thousand pounds for you right here, a thousand dollars for you right here, before you leave the door. Just produce that verse where Jesus said, I am God, worship me. Don't give me somebody else's words, don't give me no parables. If he's God, he knows how to say I'm God, and therefore worship me. Now you go home and look through your Bibles, how many Bibles you got, call the priest, call the reverend, Call the experts, see if you can get this $1,000 and call me back. I've been asking this question for the last seven, eight years all over the world, and nobody has emailed me, and nobody has produced it. And nobody dares to lie on Jesus and, make, and fabricate a verse. If he didn't say it plain and clear, he never said it. No one who made this horrendous claim ever met, walked, talked to, or received any authority from Jesus Christ to make such a claim. It was Paul and his writings to the Romans, the Corinthians, the Galatians, the pagan Roman emperors who mandated and fabricated this lie and this tremendous fa fabrication and made it official in the fourth century. The earliest gospel writers, I told you, were 40 years after Jesus, and the last one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, was 80 years after Jesus, and ironically, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, no one knows who their last name was. How could four men who wrote independently, all of them wrote according to, according to, according to, according to? Did you ever think of that? If I wrote a book and passed it on to somebody, would I write according to Khalid, and then somebody else, 15 years later, they wrote according to Matthew, according to Judy, according to Bob. Somebody would have a last name. Your passport has a last name. Your license got a last name. Your check got a last name. You were born with a last name. You wouldn't accept the check from anybody without a last name. So how in the world do the Christians accept four gospels that make Jesus Christ the son of God, makes him God, and makes him part of a trinity, and nobody seems to know their last name? Therefore, we must view Jesus as he viewed himself, a man, a prophet, and a messenger sent with a gospel to correct the deviations of the children of Israel and to announce the coming of that final and comprehensive counselor, prophet and messenger to the whole of humanity. Every Christian should set aside their false conditioning and their perpetration of this blasphemy against Almighty God and this slander against Jesus Christ and his blessed mother. Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, was the servant of Almighty God, surrendering himself to his creator, surrendering himself and saying only that which he was ordered to say. He, like all the prophets and messengers of God, said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulullah That is, they said, there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God, the creator of all. And Jesus Christ confirmed that Muhammad would be the messenger of God and that final messenger 
And that means Muhammad Rasulullah. Dear brothers and sisters, O oh Muslims, you should convey this message to your colleagues, to your co-workers, to your neighbors, in a good and a dignified, straightforward way, wanting them to free themselves of this blasphemy so they would be consistent with at least the first of the Ten Commandments. And when Jesus Christ asked his disciples, which of the commandments is the greatest? Do you remember that? What did he say? Which of the commandments, whose commandments? The commandments of Moses. What did he say? He said, hear ye, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. What did he say? He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul. And thou shalt not bow down to any graven images in the heavens or in the earth or in the sea below. And that is the law of God. That's what Jesus Christ said. So Muslims, you should invite your non-Muslim friends, neighbors, colleagues, co-workers to embrace the statement of la ilaha illallah and free themselves of this blasphemy and this crime against Almighty God and this slander against Jesus Christ. And for our guests here who are sincere Christians, I'm speaking to you, pleading with you, appealing to you, just as I'm sitting right there in chairs in front of you. Just like you're sitting right there now, it's me. So I'm talking to me. I'm looking at you, but I'm talking to myself as someone spoke to me. And I am so grateful. I'm so grateful that someone spoke to me straight enough and clear enough and gave me the evidences and the proofs and invited me to embrace the statement, La ilaha illallah, and allowed me to know and understand the prophecy of Jesus Christ that Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muslims say La ilaha illallah, say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. This is the statement that 1.4 billion people in the world, Chinese, African, Australian, American, French, German, white, black, male, female, rich, poor, from the East and the West, have embraced. We call ourselves Muslims because we surrender ourselves to Almighty God and we don't associate any partners with God. Because Abraham was a Muslim because Moses was a Muslim, because David and Solomon was a Muslim, because John the Baptist was a Muslim, because Jesus Christ was a Muslim, and of course Muhammad was a Muslim because Muslim means one who surrenders himself and submits themselves to Almighty God. Don't get trapped up by the Arabic language. It simply means one that surrenders themselves. Because if, if I caught you out there in the street and, and I put a pistol in your face in the dark and I said, give me all your money. If I said it in Arabic or English, you would give it to me. You would surrender. Well, who is more powerful? Almighty God, who is more worthy to be worshipped? Who is more worthy to surrender to, to acknowledge, to embrace, to submit your own fears? Or Almighty God? Muslims say, La ilaha illallah. Say, Muhammad Rasulullah. This is the statement, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that we invite you to embrace. It is not our job to convert anybody. Conversion is something of the heart, something of the tongue. God gives everybody a tongue to do what they want to do with it. God gives everybody the heart and the chance. So if your hearts are open, and if your minds are open, my suggestion for you is that you should say in your hearts, La ilaha illallah. You should say in your minds by the conviction of what Jesus Christ said concerning Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, knowing that Jesus Christ prophesied Muhammad and that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam confirmed Jesus Christ. Yes, they came together on the statement of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. I want to thank the organizers of this, uh, this lecture. I want to thank even the people who offered this lecture hall to us 
I want to thank uh, all the brothers and sisters of Australia, of uh, Sydney, uh, or wherever you came from to hear this lecture. Um, uh, I, I want to thank especially uh, the non-Muslims that came here out of curiosity. Um, if you came here thinking that maybe um, some strange guy from America is going to be there, let me just go and see what he's talking about. If you came for that reason, that's okay also. But those who came because perhaps the subject itself was critical for you and you wanted to hear perhaps the Islamic perspective on Jesus Christ, the prophet of Allah, I want to thank you. And I'm going to remind you that the life you save may be your own. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi And the mantra that Jesus preached, which was, turn the other cheek. Muslims preach killing and slaying unbelievers wherever you find them. If Jesus and Muhammad preach the same universal message, why does one preach peace and the other does not? First of all, uh, let, let me see if I can put this here in proper context. Uh, if the Christian who wrote this can remember, or if a Christian wrote this, uh, Jesus told his disciples to sell their belongings and purchase swords. Now he never lived to lead them into warfare, but certainly he didn't tell them to sell their belongings and buy swords to turn the other cheek. So you can isolate, if you want, just one statement of Jesus Christ at the same token, when he went into the temple and ran out the money changers and said to them that you are not the sons of Abraham, but you are the sons of your father, the devil, and he beat them across their backs with sticks. He was not preaching love. So I'd just like to say to you that the other th thing that you should keep in mind about Jesus Christ, in case you don't know, is that his entire mission was only two years and four months. Two years and four months. So obviously Jesus Christ could not do much. He said many powerful things of which we accept all of them, but he wasn't sent to be a warrior. He wasn't sent to be a ruler. He wasn't sent to be a statesman. So whatever he wasn't sent, we don't expect for him to do that, but that did not limit the message of God. Now let's take another prophet that came before Jesus Christ, Solomon and David. Did they preach, teach, uh, turn the other cheek? They were prophets of God. They loved God. God loved them. Certainly there was, a, uh, uh, and Jesus Christ, in case you don't know, was a descendant of David, wasn't he? So a descendant of David and a prophet of Almighty God, he spoke the message that God told him to speak. And we didn't say that they were identical in what they spoke. We said that they were both prophets and they were both sent by Almighty God and they were both messengers. Yes, there is a distinction in their message. One came to preach a gospel to announce the other. The other one came to teach a comprehensive message. And Almighty God said to us in the Quran, had he not checked one group of people by another, then there would be synagogues, temples, churches, and mosques desecrated and pulled down, and there would be corruption in the earth. What does checking one people by the other mean? Some people who are aggressors, who want to take other things from other people, take their land and rape their women, if somebody doesn't check them, they will do that all over the world. So from time to time, Almighty God, who's the knower of his creatures, he checks one group of people by the other. As for the statement of Muslims wanting to kill, I think that it's unfair for anyone to characterize Muslims as just wanting to kill Christians and Jews like we're some kind of bloodthirsty vampires running through the earth, you know what I mean, saying people accept Islam or die. You will not find any one of the 2.3 million new Muslims in America who were told by anybody, accept Islam or die. 
you will not find any of the 78,000 Muslims, new Muslims that accepted Islam last year in America that accepted Islam because somebody told them to accept Islam or die. You will not find any of the 26,000 new Muslims in Europe that are in the UK that accepted Islam because somebody said accept Islam or die. So I think that you need to be more open-minded and a little bit less uh, preconditioned when you want to talk about Islam. And if you want to read the Quran, if you want to quote the Quran to us, it's 6,626 verses. Speak about all the verses and see how you can compare Muhammad and Jesus Christ because that's what we're trying to do. Don't isolate a verse that you don't know what the meaning of it is and don't isolate something about Jesus Christ which you equally don't know the meaning of. And God, he knows best. Another question says, are you trying to portray that seven-eighths of the Christian scripture current is mainly based on the teaching of Paul who was a bounty hunter? That's what I said. That's exactly what I said. I said seven-eighths, or let's be a little more liberal. Let's say six-eighths. How many books are in the New Testament? Well, divide them. And you'll find that six-eighths of them or three-quarters of them are written by Paul. And Paul was a bounty hunter. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He took the name of Paul. He never saw Jesus Christ, ever, except in that vision that only he saw while there were three other people with him. So that's exactly what I said. Don't feel bad. What you just simply need to do is continue your reading beyond what Paul said and what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the ones who didn't have a second name said. Just be open-minded enough to go a little bit beyond there and Khalid didn't say this. Khalid didn't say that to you. Look to the Encyclopedia Britannica. You, you got a computer? Look to the Compton Encyclopedia. Go to the Christian Encyclopedia. Go to the, go to the Concord of Christianity. Go to the Catholic Digest. Go to a thousand other books and you will see. This is not what college said. I'm just giving you the statistics. That's exactly what I said. A non-Muslim said, who took the place of Jesus when he was supposedly on the cross? Well, many of the uh, scholars, many of the scholars said that it was the one that betrayed him for seven pieces of silver. Who was that? Judas. Now we know historically that Judas looked more like Jesus Christ than any of the other disciples. We don't have any proof that it was Judas. The proof that I gave you was that it wasn't Jesus Christ that was crucified or killed. That's what I said. I don't have any further evidence, but I'm only giving you some indications that church fathers, church scholars, Bible scholars have indicated. And I said after that, God knows best. He said, did Muhammad have access to the scriptures? No, he didn't have access to the scriptures. He had access to God. And God is the one that revealed all the scriptures to all his prophets. So the same angel that came to Abraham and the same angel that came to Moses and the same angel that came to David, came to Solomon, came to Isaac, came to Zechariah, that came to John the Baptist, came to Jesus Christ, the same angel Gabriel came to the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and taught him what he needed to be taught by Almighty God. All you need to do is, as a Christian, You've read many books throughout your life, many books. I say to you that don't you think that it would be worthy of you to take a copy of the Quran, which is available. You can download it today if you want to. You can get it on CD, DVD. You can read it right off of the computer if you want off the website. Or you can be given a copy of it, one like this one. And you can read 10 pages a day and become a critique, a, a, a critic of the Quran. See what it is. Compare it. And then after that, come and ask your questions. At least, but, though, but be fair. Be equitable.
Be reasonable. Read it first before you make comments or you reject it. That's all I ask you to do, because that's my job. I read the Bible. I'm still reading from time to time. Then you read the Quran. Can you tell me the verse in the Bible that says the Prophet Muhammad is to come after me and explain it, please? Uh, I have that verse for you. Uh, I won't quote it for you or the people that's here. But if you see me immediately after this meeting, I'll give you the verse itself because I'm not a quota of the Bible. I am not an authority on the Bible and I didn't come here to quote the Bible. I'm not an authority on the Quran, but the Quran is a book that I use for research and for my following and for my legislation. I read the Bible for reference purposes, not for propagation purposes. And I don't read it because I believe everything in it is authentic. So I don't want to promote it. But what I will do for you is I will give you the evidence in your book where your book said and your church father said that in this chapter and verse, according to the Gospel of Barnabas, that he named the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessed be upon him, directly. And according to the Gospel of Barnabas, if you want to know where it's at, it's in a book called the Apocrypha. Maybe you can't spell it, but you can find it. The Apocrypha are five books that were taken out of the scriptures because the Romans, or at the Council of Nicaea, they didn't like those five books, so they took them out. That's why they're called Apocrypha. The Gospel of Barnabas is one of those books. I'll give you that after the meeting. Do you believe faith before knowledge or knowledge before faith? Well, that's kind of a tricky question, isn't it? I, I don't answer tricky questions. But how can you have faith without knowledge? If someone didn't call you by your name when you were a child, you wouldn't respond to your name. That's called knowledge. You can't worship God if you don't know God. You can't repair a car if you don't know the parts of the car. You can't count money if you can't do math. So certainly, knowledge comes before faith. Faith is based upon knowledge. This is what we're taught, that faith is based upon knowledge. When God wants to inspire his servants, when God wants to instruct his servants, what does he do? He gives them knowledge. After he gives them knowledge of himself, knowledge of the world, knowledge of themselves, then after that, he gives them the basis for faith and, and, and conviction. So yes, we believe that knowledge comes before faith. Brother, you said to become a Muslim, you need to convert. I didn't say that. Nobody heard me say that. If you want to be a Muslim, you need to convert. I never used the word convert ever. I'm not a convert. I am a revert. Every child that's born is born in innocence. Jesus Christ even said, you cannot come unto the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom of God except as what? As a child. Innocent. Jesus did never say to anybody that a child that's innocent, free of any sin, is born when they're born in the world, a sin is stamped on their forehead. That doesn't even make sense. And if you want to say that all of us are born in sin because Adam and Eve committed a sin, no, Adam and Eve succumbed to their natural human instincts which God created them to do. And then God taught them names and knowledge and showed them how to repent, which they did. How does Almighty God hold all the creatures responsible for a mistake of the first ones he made and he knew? That's not just. That's something that was been configured by somebody else. No. The bearer of a burden doesn't bear the burden of another. The one that commits a crime, the one that has committed no crime doesn't bear the crime of a person that commits a crime. That doesn't make sense at all. No, a child is innocent. 
So therefore, all of us are born with what we call a natural disposition. What is that natural disposition? It's the same disposition a child has when it's born to find the breast of its mother. No one has to tell that child to look for the breast of the mother. Instinctively, when the child is born, the breasts fill up with milk and the child finds the breast. That's the instinct God put in that child. And that's the instinct God placed in the lactating breast of the woman. In the same instinct, we search for God. We search for what is right. We search for what is clean, what is decent, what is fair. We search for ways to worship and know God. And through searching, that's our natural disposition to worship, to know God, and to submit to God. So what I did, I got through. By the grace of God, I was able to break through, find my way through the preconditioning that somebody else put on me. And Islam found me. And when, I, when it found me, I found it and I embraced it. So I embraced Islam and I became a revert to my natural disposition. Suppose miracles and mantras have occurred for the last 2,000 years. How do you as a Muslim explain this? God does what he wills. The Quran says, فَعَالُ لِمَا يُرِيدُ Almighty God does whatever he pleases. And a phenomena, which is called in Arabic, mu'ajiza. Mu'ajiza in Arabic, it means a phenomena, or we call it a miracle, something that cannot be explained by scientific law or rationale. These are happening all the time. But God gives this to prophets to do one thing, to prove to those who doubt that they have been sent by Almighty God. So every prophet that was sent received a mu'ajiza. There are no more prophets, so there's no more human beings walking around with any mu'ajiza. The reason why I ask, uh, are all human beings born Muslim? I just answered that, yes. All human beings are born submitting to their natural disposition. In the Arabic word, it means to surrender and to submit to your natural disposition. That is not to have any rebellion towards that which is ordering you, that which is uh, uh, cultivating you. This is called to surrender. And in Arabic, the word surrender means Muslim. When a person recognizes Almighty God, acknowledges Almighty God, conforms to Almighty God, and worships Almighty God, that means in Arabic language, Muslim. The reason why I ask is that I know a Christian family who gave birth to a child and the grandmother pressured her daughter to baptize, christen the child immediately due to her reason that the child is a Muslim until such time it is baptized or christened. Well, I'm not responsible for that conviction. What is the name of the missing detracted Bible chapter which mentioned the forthcoming of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Uh, I mentioned that it's called the Apocrypha. There are five books of which the, the Gospel of Barnabas is one. It's called the Apocrypha. Uh, just put it in on your computer, on your search. If you spell it wrong, uh, you know, take it and put on the, uh, the speller and it'll spell it right for you and it'll bring it right there to you. Uh, if Paul wrote the, um, the Testament and that is uh, not correct or distorted, is there or more error or correct an authentic Bible? Um, no, as a matter of fact, um, what Paul has written along with other collaborating writers has been widely accepted by the Christian world. But that's not my fault. They're accepting it without investigating it. It's not my fault because there is evidence that the church fathers, Bible scholars, have written extensively. And again, for those who want some evidence of that, I've got it with me. I can share that with you too. And if this is not enough, again, Go to your computer and put in the word Paul, Paul of Tars, Saul of Tarsus. And then you, it'll pop up and you'll get the whole history of all the books he wrote 
then what you do is deduct what he wrote from all the books of the New Testament and then you get the formula. Then you deduct the other four that didn't have a name and you get the formula. Then you see you got no other books left. It's a simple process. I was told by a non-Muslim that Jesus sometimes was God and sometimes man. And we have no right to understand this. Well, if you don't have a right to understand it, then uh, you don't need to know the PIN number to your bank account either. You wouldn't agree with that. Or if I said, give me your PIN number, you wouldn't agree with that. But you don't think we have a right to know whether Jesus is God or man. That doesn't make sense to me. I think you're just being a little stubborn there. Does Judas have any reference made to him in the Quran? Absolutely not. No, he doesn't. There's no need for it. Judas wasn't a prophet, and he wasn't a companion of the prophet Muhammad, Salat of Islam. And enough has been said about Judas. And I think that Jesus Christ said enough at that last supper that we don't need to say anything more about Judas. I think it's very clear to everybody that whether it was Judas crucified or not, one or two things happened to Judas. Either Judas committed suicide by diving off of a mountain, or Judas was killed in the place of Jesus Christ. One or two, and all the Bible scholars agree with that. One or two different fates happened to Judas. And so I don't think there's any other need for us to make reference to Judas because everyone agrees about what took place with him. Some Muslims have experienced or explained to me that it was not Jesus who was crucified, but replaced by an enemy to take his place on the cross. That's correct. That's, uh, that's one of the um, more popular theories. No evidence of that. And we don't put it forward as a fact. It's a theory. Uh, and that's not our theory. That's a theory of the Bible scholars and historians. Can you further explain what crucifixion means? I think that everybody here heard what I said. Crucifixion means to die on the cross. It doesn't mean to be nailed to the cross. For experiments have been made. Some Christians themselves have went through nailing themselves on the cross. And they have found that by nails being driven through your hands and the nails being driven through your feet into a wooden cross and you're hanging there doesn't cause you to die, not immediately. You will die from exhaustion. You will die from loss of blood in three or four days maybe, but it doesn't happen in a few hours. Crucifixion means death on the cross. So if you don't die, it's not crucifixion, just like execution means death by injection or death by uh, a gas or death by electrocution. If you don't die, they're going to put some more in you. Neither did Jesus die, nor did he die for our sins. I mean, that would be double jeopardy. I mean, we're still sinning. So that means you, that if you're sinning now and Jesus died for the sins, then you can just sin from now on, and you don't even have to pay for it. We just might as well, everybody's a sin. So what's the use in following scripture at all? That doesn't even make sense. If you try to explain that to your children, they will tell you, Dad, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> Do the representatives of the Vatican continue to deny up until today the prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam? They do not deny it. You need to read the Vatican has a section which is dedicated to the study of the Quran to the life of the Prophet Muhammad Islam, and the event of Islam, and they have written conclusively that Muhammad is a prophet of God. They have written that conclusively. They just haven't, rec haven't resolved or ratified the relationship between Jesus Christ and Muhammad Islam. because if they did that, there would be no need for the Vatican. What and why made you revert? Well, there's nothing really extraordinary about that, I'll be honest. If you think I've got some kind of extraordinary story like Paul, I don't. <laughs> 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 uh, 
No, uh, Islam found me, honestly. Islam found me, and I'm just grateful for it, and there's no real extraordinary story. But um, I'll give you my card, and if you want to uh, send me an email, I'll, I'll send you a little half a page and tell you how I became a Muslim. I'll be glad to do that. Uh, the brother wanted me to mention to people that uh, I became a Muslim in 1965 and that this was the same year that uh, our brother al Haj Malik Shabazz, better known to the world as Malcolm X, that he was assassinated. Yes, I did get the chance to meet him. Uh, we were not homeboys, but I did get a chance to meet him. Uh, and his life and his sacrifice, not Malcolm X, honestly, uh, uh, I don't uh, revere and I don't propagate the life of Malcolm X or his message. But when the, caterpillar, when the caterpillar turned into a butterfly, for only three months or two and a half months, after he made his pilgrimage, he repented. He straightened up and flew correctly. He repented to God. He became a Muslim. Then he became al Haj Malik Shabazz. And in those two and a half or three months, the words that he said, coupled with the dynamic speech that he had, was impressive to the world. You cannot find a library any, anywhere in the world. I told you I've been to 37 countries and I'll tell you for sure, there's no country in the world I've been to where there's not a library, a major library, that doesn't have some of the works of Malcolm X there. So he, evidently he's a profound person all over the world. He's affected people all over the world. Well, in 1965, I was 18 years old. So I've given you now the formula, right? I was 18 years old and um, and uh, I accepted Islam about six months after he was assassinated. Uh, can you explain uh, the Trinity in Christian terms and explain how it is wrong? Um, okay, I think this is about the fourth question that I said that I will stay here after everybody else leaves if you pay me. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, I'll, I'll stay here after everybody else leaves and I think there's a room that we can sit, those who are really sincere. Now, if you're not sincere, you just want to like corner me and badger me with some, some tricky questions, please don't waste your time and don't waste my time. But the person that asked this particular question, I have that also in this book right here for you. I figured that somebody would ask that, so I have that. And I'll tell you exactly what is said that the Trinity means, but I won't take up the question period to answer that particular question. Now, I won't take up this uh, time to answer that. But yes, we can answer it because it's written. And again, I'm referring you to what? To the web, the World Wide Web. Most of this information that you're asking me, anybody can get it. Just like you can get pornography there that you don't ask for. <laughs> you can get it. <laughs> Does the... Um, does the Old Testament, and, and I'm not com making a comparison between the two. Does the Old Testament mention Muhammad and where? What is the Old Testament? Where is it? Why is there a New Testament? Uh, is the Old Testament same or different to the Bible? Uh, there was never a scripture set by Almighty God called the Old Testament. It was the Romans after the Council of Nicaea who made the division between scriptures and called what came before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and what Paul wrote, the New Testament. I mean, they call that the Old Testament and what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote and what Paul wrote, they call that the New Testament. Why did they call it that? Because the Old Testament was the covenant to be followed by the Jews and the Nazarenes. And the New Testament was to be followed by those that call themselves Christians under the mandate of the Romans. But there's no scripture called Old or New Testament. That's something that somebody else made up. And there's no book called the Bible. God didn't reveal the Bible to anybody. You referred to Jesus as being a rabbi. Yes, that was his title. The word rabbi means two things. Rabbi could mean Lord. Not the Lord of the heavens and the earth, but like landlord or like a teacher. So rabbi, just like you got rabbis today, are people who are learned in the law. Jesus Christ was given a special gift by Almighty God. He was given the, 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 the law in his mouth. 
God gave him a special ability to write and to speak and to determine the law. So he was called the rabbi, the great teacher. That was the name that he was called. So was he a Jew or a Muslim? He was both. He was a Jew because he was from the tribe of Judah. He was a Muslim because he submitted himself to Almighty God and he did what Almighty God ordered him to do. And that would be real good if all the Jews became Muslims. Because that's what Jesus was. What's Jesus' last name? The, um, well, obviously, he didn't have the last name of his father because he didn't have a father. Uh, and Mary was born from her mother, Hannah. Now, the, the Quran doesn't tell us who was the father of Hannah, uh, but the, and the Bible doesn't tell us who was the, who was the husband of Hannah. But there, is, but there is a genealogy for Jesus Christ in the Bible, as well as outside of the Bible, again, you can get it if you go to the computer. Put in the word Hannah, and it'll bring you four different Hannahs. Then you want to know which Hannah. Put in Hannah, the mother of Mary. And you keep on searching until you find the right Hannah. And then you ask another question, and you're going to lead to her genealogy. But for us, that issue is not important. We know that Hannah was the mother of Mary and that Mary was the mother of Jesus. This is what we know. What was the name of Mary's husband? Joseph. After she had Jesus Christ, she married a gentleman by the name of Joseph. And they had another son whose name was James. But James was not the father of Jesus. I mean, if you're implying something here. And did James, her son, work with Jesus during the work of Allah? I don't know if they worked together. To be honest with you, I don't know if they worked together. We, we know very little about the early life of Jesus Christ. Your guess might be as good as mine. There's a lot of different theories that he, was, that he wandered to India or this or that or so-and-so. We know that he was engaged in carpentry and also that he was a shepherd. But we know very little about the early life of Jesus Christ. And we don't really need to. Because Jesus Christ is known to the world for his gospel, not for his early life. And that gospel was two years and four months. A very powerful, intense two years and four months. And I don't know the Arabic word for James. I was doing a dua for, to a dawa for a friend, and she told me that her Sunday school teacher explained the Trinity as God coming down to earth as a human to show people the right way. Well, all oh, that's right, so she needs to probably go to Monday school. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever that teacher was, she, she, she's not even reading her Bible. Or for that matter, she's not reading any authority of the father, the church fathers or Bible scholars at all. That is not what the Trinity means. Uh, I think if we have time before uh, and we answer all these questions, here's about 10 more questions, I can maybe just read that for you. Since If it comes up the third time, I'm going to read it. Uh, but that person who asked that question, you also can... Uh, just meet me. Uh, don't, don't worry, I'm, we're not going to meet in one of those special rooms where the angel came down. But there's, there's, there's a room here that we can meet in, I think, and I can answer that question for you. Thank you for your beautiful talk on the prophet Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you also for your uh, compliment. Uh, my um, question is what, uh, what uh, and how are Muslims supposed to act and do when the prophet Jesus returns? Uh, since Muslims and Christians believe Jesus will return and will follow, should we not live in peace and harmony with Christians until that Islam is not the enemy? That's correct. Well, let's make this issue here clear. Neither the Quran 
nor any Muslim scholars or anyone ever said that Christians themselves are the enemies of Muslims. Nobody said that. It is not the Christian themselves that we have a deference to. It is the statement that people make from their mouths which they have no right to make as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَذْلَمُ مِنْ مَنْ افْتَرَ اللَّهِ كَذِبًا مَنْ افْتَرَ عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا وَهُوَ يُدْعَى إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ It is this statement that people make which they have no evidence for, which is a blasphemy against God. Which is, a, which is a slander against Jesus Christ and his mother, saying that God is three, or saying that God is a son, or saying that Jesus Christ is God. This is the issue that we have. And this is what we're trying to address. Now, we have an enmity towards that issue because God has an enmity towards that issue. So it's not personal. It's principle. What is the contradiction in the number of days in the particular day which Jesus was supposedly crucified? <clears throat> um, the number of days in the particular day and the particular day. Uh, if Jesus Christ was placed on a cross, I'd like to repeat myself, it was Friday. And it was Friday in the early afternoon. As a Jew, he could not have remained on the cross further than sunset. Because even today, a person of the Jewish faith who is an Orthodox Jew, they cannot be arrested and held in prison by the police during their Sabbath. But they can be escorted to their home or, the, or their synagogue and they can stay there until the Sabbath is over, and then they can be arrested and taken to jail. They can't push a button. They can't do anything on the Sabbath because it's a part of their faith. It's understood around the world. It was understood then. So therefore, I say that if Jesus Christ was put on the cross, that's not crucifixion. He had to be taken down because he was a Jew. But we don't know if that's the case. We said it's a theory. What we do know is he was not crucified and he was not killed. This is the issue. Those who witnessed, if there was a crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there was only three people there documented according to your books. Mary Magdalena, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Joseph of Arathemia were the only three according to your scriptures that was on the hill of Golgotha that day. How can or does Christianity explain its saints and other purported major day miracles? Why is the divisiveness between Christianity, Protestants, Anglicans, Catholics, etc.? What is the right, what is the right wing American Christian view of Jesus? Um, this is a three point question, almost like the Trinity. So it's a little difficult for me to answer. It's, it's kind of a mystery too. Uh, but I think it's a question that I can address, and I'll, I'll take that question also um, in the upper room, I mean in, in the other room. Uh, if Jesus did not die on the cross, why did he say to the two thieves, who said he said that? Who said it was Jesus that said that? No evidence that Jesus said that. How can we as Muslims minimize the sections within our religion and unite as one? That's a different subject altogether, uh, but I think that uh, you should know the answer to that, inshallah. Uh, the last couple of questions here, and uh, thank you very much for being, um, uh, you people are being very nice to me that I don't have to answer a lot of questions. What is the difference between a Jew and a Hebrew? Uh, a Jew is a uh, person who's part of the tribe of Judah. They take their, uh, their lineage from the tribe of Judah. This was the original meaning of a Jew. A uh, Jew is a general terminology, which means people who are part of the nation of Israel. Uh, but originally, the Jews was the law-keeping body of the Bani Israel. There were how many tribes in the Bani Israel? How many sons did Jacob have? 
12. Judah was one. What was their job? They were the scribes. They were the lawyers. They were the elite. They were the ones who wrote the prescriptions. So the tribe of Judah, they were also the class of the priests. And so to be known as a Jew was a, um, was a title, was a privilege. And now because it was a privilege to be called the Jew, everyone who is of the Hebrew faith or speaks the Hebrew language generally is referred to as a Jew, but originally it was a tribe and a priestly class. Um, I want to thank uh, 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 all of you uh, Muslim brothers and sisters. I want to thank the non-Muslims especially for your tolerance and your patience. I want to say that um, I, didn't, I didn't mean to um, uh, step on anybody's toes, uh, but if I did, that's because you got pretty long shoes. Um, and I didn't mean to um, malign anybody or hurt anybody's feelings, and I didn't uh, cast any aspersions upon Jesus Christ or upon Christianity, or upon the Christians. That wasn't the aim. The aim was to try to reconcile the life of Jesus Christ as a man, as a prophet, as a messenger of Almighty God and a servant of Almighty God. We hope that we have done some justice in this regard and that we have said something that may stimulate your thinking. Uh, for those of you uh, who would kind of like to choke me or knock me out, uh, or ask some further questions. Um, I'll be available for you before you leave. Okay, thank you very much. What is the purpose of life? Why is it that when we ask the simple question, what is the purpose of our lives? Why do we get so many different answers? It is because people haven't really thought about it. It's too frightening. Not the question itself is frightening, but what's frightening is that if we answer it clearly, it may change our lives indelibly, and we are afraid of change. And now we have discovered that Every part of creation that has been discovered is inside of a drop of water. Well, the Quran already said that to us 1,500 years ago, that we created everything and every single thing from water. The Quran said that. We want to talk this evening about Jesus, the son of Mary, and his phenomenal birth. A birth that very few human beings, whether Muslims or Christians, have any argument about. We believe, and our Quran makes it clear for us and confirms for us that Jesus Christ, in fact, he was born without the intervention of sperm. That his mother, Mary, that blessed woman, she became pregnant by the word of God. No man touched her. Eight murders or homicides are committed every 19 minutes. And two rapes are committed every seven minutes. And there are three robberies every 59 seconds. There are 257,000 children that are legally or illegally aborted. That is, 257,000 children are killed in the womb by license. 21 million children are born every year out of wedlock who do not know their mothers and fathers, or who do not know whom they are fathered by. 2.8 million suicides every year 
of human beings who find no reason to live. With these kinds of social problems inside of their own boundaries, inside of their own governments, in their own institutions, how can they bring peace to the world? It doesn't make sense. O oh, Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds you and me that whatever good happens, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if something else happens, this is from our own hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has ordered you and I to enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. And when we cease to do that, we don't enjoin the right, we don't enjoin, uh, enjoin the, we don't enjoin the right, we don't forbid the wrong, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that He will visit us a calamity from Himself. So that When the calamity happens or you are punished and the musibah comes upon you and you call upon Allah, He will not answer. What do the Muslims of today expect? The character of the Muslim is the most important part of the Muslim. Not what he or she says, not only what he or she wears, not where they come from or who their mother or father is or grandfather. Not the country they live in or for that matter if they live next to the Kaaba. This is not important at all. It is the character because the character is the actual fruit. And we can remember on the occasion when the Prophet وسلم, invited his companions to make a sacrifice in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, he brought half of his wealth. And he considered this to have been a major sacrifice. And he was very proud of that. But when Abu Bakr radiallahu an came, Abu Bakr, he brought all of his wealth. And when the Prophet ﷺ asked Abu Bakr what he had left for his family, what was the response of Abu Bakr ﷺ? He said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu. Allah and his messenger ﷺ. And it was by the suggestion or the order of the Prophet ﷺ that Abu Bakr took back some of his wealth for his family. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there was no one from among the Muslims who displayed his loyalty to Allah and his Messenger ﷺ similar to that of Abu Bakr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, yes, definitely, who? Who is better? Who is more excellent? than the one that calls towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just calling, not just shouting, not just arguing. But they are acting upon what they are calling. They are setting a precedent for what they are calling to. They have established a behavior, a paradigm, an example to what they are calling to. And they openly say, announce, I am Muslim. Where oceans and rivers meet, does the ocean take over the river? It doesn't, although the ocean might be five times, six times, eight times, ten times larger than a river. And you know, if you took two bodies of water and you put a funnel in between them, what would happen? The larger body would absorb the smaller body, wouldn't they? But in the case of the ocean and the river, it doesn't happen because Allah said he put a bazaq. So they do not overcome each other. And one of our uh, Jacques Cousteau, who passed away now, he was a marine biologist. 
he was able to film under the ocean where the rivers meet the ocean and the river meets the ocean and the ocean meets the river and they go back. They meet and they go back. So therefore the rivers return back to itself and the ocean returns back to itself and they do not overcome each other. How did the prophet know that? Islam has five fundamental pillars, the first of which is to bear witness that there is none to be worshipped except Almighty God, consistent with the first commandment given to Moses, consistent with the first commandment that Jesus Christ also said is the greatest of the commandments. Hear you, Israel, the Lord thy God is one, absolutely one, not the number one. Not the number one that could be divided into one, two, three. Not the number one that could be multiplied. But absolutely one, having no one besides, no other God besides. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul, and thou shalt not worship anyone except the Lord thy God nor bow down to any graven images in the heavens or the earth or the sea below. Such said Moses, and such said confirmed Jesus Christ, and such said the Quran. This is what we bear witness, and this is the first pillar of Islam, and the most important. If war erupts in Iraq, more than 3,000 missiles will be rained upon Iraq in a course of six, six hours and more than a half a million people will be killed. Can you tell me how the lives of a half a million people are equal to a leader, Saddam Hussein? If America was able to go into South America and pull out, what was the guy's name, General uh, Noriega. Noriega. America was selling drugs with Noriega, but then Noriega flipped on them. So they went in and took this man from his country, brought him out, and put him in jail for life in their country. So why did they not just go into Iraq and pull out Saddam? No, they need to go into Iraq. Why? Because you'll find that in a matter of six months after the war, the prices in the oil will go down. And as we speak right now, there are 27 mega companies, mega companies who are bidding for contracts for the reconstruction of Iraq. What does it have to do with Saddam Hussein and democracy? If a man had to get pregnant and have a baby, he would die. And then on top of that, if he had to look forward to taking care of that child for the next 10, 15, 20 years, and sometime the mother, she's taking care of a grown child. Men who still live with their mothers, you couldn't do it. And still she's taking care of herself, and she's taking care of her husband. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward those sisters. And may Allah cover their faults. And may Allah cause the husbands and brothers and sons to appreciate them because they are the goodly trees that bear the goodly fruit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made brotherhood very sacred, very important. It's the whole basis of the Muslim society, brotherhood. And when there's no brotherhood, believe it, there is no substance among the Muslims. No substance. The first principle and characteristics of da'wah is that the da'i has to have knowledge. Not just ambition, not just emotional drive, and not just a reaction to some insult that somebody has said, and not just a feeling to want to give da'wah because you know it's an obligation. All of those things are good, and it's all necessary. But without knowledge, what are you going to do? But always show your composure and your willingness to talk to anybody. Because why? 
you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the very beginning. The Messenger of Allah said, he didn't have all the answers, but he put his trust upon Allah. Allah says to him, فَتَوَكَّلُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ القائد أعلى المسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد